raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. We both love the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and we love history. But most of all, we love Olympic and Paralympic history. From the epic and inspirational moments we all love, to the, well, the more bizarre and controversial moments, we're fascinated by it all. Which is why we are on a journey through all of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, from the ancient Olympics held at Olympia, all the way to now. Last season, we talked at length about the disaster of the 1900 Olympic Games, where the marketing team literally went out of their way to call the Olympics, well, almost everything but the Olympics. The father of the modern Olympic movement, Pierre de Coubertin, was not happy, especially since, well, Paris was his hometown. But now, in 1924, with the Olympic Games established as the greatest international sports festival in the world, Paris has a chance to redeem itself. The question is, will it? So, Sarah, I'm excited about this one because, as we talked about in our Wild Card movie episode from last season, my favorite movie of all time is Chariots of Fire, which centers on the 1924 Summer Olympics. So, other than that movie, uh, tell me what you knew about these games. You know, in our previous episode, I talked about how I need to turn in my fan card um, for not knowing the backstory of the Winter Olympic Games beginning. Um, so I I know that we both like the movie Chariots of Fire. So I mm -hmm. also um, knew about the Chariots of Fire story, um, which I know that we'll get into later. So I don't want to go down that rabbit trail yet. Um, and right. I knew that it was better than the 1900 Olympics, but I honestly didn't know a ton <laughs> of details about it. I mean, I've read about it here yeah. and there, just looking up different Olympic facts, but I've never done a deep dive like what we're doing today. What about you? I'm exactly the same as you. If, if you have to turn your fan card in, then so do I, because literally <laughs> all I knew about the 1924 games was the storyline from Chariots of Fire. So, so this was fun for me to do that deeper dive and learn a little bit more of the history behind these games that I hadn't known before. So I'm excited that we're going to get into it in a little bit more detail and tell you things mm -hmm. that don't show up in that movie. Uh, so let's start off with a quick little overview of the 1924 Summer Games. I guess we now have to call them that since we've got them split between winter and summer now. Uh, so 24 years after the confusing disaster of the Second Olympic Games in Paris 1900, Baron Pierre de Coubertin is set to oversee his last Olympic Games as president of the IOC. He intends the Eighth Olympiad in Paris to be his swan song to the movement he helped found. But first... Sarah, give us some highlights. <laughs> Happy to. Here we go. The games ran from May 4th to July 27th, and it marked the first time for a host city to host the games twice, though it's debatable how much Paris 1900 should <laughs> count as hosting, which, again, yeah. shameless plug, go back and listen to that episode if you want the full story. Yep. This was also the first time there was a media broadcast made specifically about the Olympics, which we love. We love that. Yeah. This was the first time we saw an official Olympic village. While athletes had been given lodging at previous games, Paris built a group of wood cabins in one area specifically for athletes. Wood cabins sounds so homey, doesn't it? It does. It sounds very American, honestly. I know. <laughs> I'm just picturing like a bunch of people around a campfire singing Kumbaya or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, it's also the first time the Olympic motto was used. Citius, Altius, Fortius, or faster, higher, stronger. 
This was the motto, of course, until it changed for Tokyo 2020 to faster, higher, stronger, together. Okay. We're not going to list all the new countries here who participated, but we do have to give a special shout out to Ireland. Irish athletes had been part of the Olympics since the beginning, but grudgingly having to represent Great Britain, which led to quite a bit of drama over the years. But here in 1924, they were finally recognized as their own independent national committee and could compete under their own flag in every sport. Yeah, and we've talked quite a bit in the past about some of the conflict between (laughs) Ireland (laughs) and Great Britain and, yeah, the athletes not always loving, you know, having the Union Jack flying. Uh, I forget his name now, but we had the guy at the Intercalated Games who literally climbed the flagpole Uh (laughs) with the Irish flag to cover up the Union Jack flag when he won. So that was fun. Yeah. So it's great for Ireland that finally they get to be completely separate as their own delegation underneath their own flag. Uh, But yeah, we have a lot more countries uh, participating this time around. So that's exciting for the movement as a whole. And before we get into the background on how these games came together, let's take a little bit of a break and then we'll be right back. Okay, so honestly, the background story for the 1924 Paris Games is... Pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Uh, During the 20th session of the IOC in 1921, there were actually several bids to consider for host cities for the 1924 games. There was Barcelona, Spain, Los Angeles, United States, Praha, Czechoslovakia, Rome, Italy. Some of those should sound familiar because they do eventually become host cities, of course. But... Coubertin basically stood up in the meeting and said, Paris is hosting, okay? I'm retiring as IOC president after the games. This is how it's going to be, and it's going to be awesome. Of course he did. (laughs) Yeah, not exactly a verbatim quote, but you get the idea. That's how it plays out in my brain. (laughs) And it's also not that unbelievable that it could have played out that way. Come on. It's not. He was not one to beat around the bush. We already know that about him. He was going to say exactly what was on his mind. And so, yes, he made it very well known to the other members that he not only wanted Paris to host the games again, he was pretty much demanding it. So, you know, being a democratic organization, they still had to vote on it. And when they held the vote, 14 members voted for Paris Four members voted against. You you always have to have a few people there, you know, to buck the system. And then there were four who abstained. So ultimately, yes, Coubertin got his got his way. And ultimately, he wanted to see Paris redeem itself from the 1900 games. Uh, Again, not going to go down that storyline again. People can go listen to that episode. But he wanted to make sure it was done Right, especially now that the Olympics had more momentum behind them, uh, and also to avoid some of the problems that Antwerp had faced with their finances in 1920. Okay, Sarah, let's let's talk Paris real quick. I've shared before about how I've I've not been there, um, other than the airport. Uh, so uh, I believe you've been there. So yeah. what's your thoughts on yeah. the city? Yeah, I spent. Um two segments in Paris, like not a full summer, but I went twice and both times were for about six weeks. And, um, and I love Paris. I love Paris. I didn't get to explore, um, as much as I would have liked because of the work that I was doing. But, um, but yeah, that being said, it's a gorgeous city. Um, it's beautiful. I think a lot of people, at least in 2022, I think a lot of people, um, expect it to be like how it is portrayed in the movies. So they forget mm. it's an international city where it still has trash and things like that. <laughs> um, but that being said, it, it's a beautiful international city. Like it's not perfect, but it's wonderful. And and of course my experience was in like 2012 um, and mm. that 
that kind of time frame. So very, <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine what Paris was like in the 1920s, not mm. to, not to distract us too much, but one of my favorite movies is Midnight in Paris. And I, I love would just Midnight say, in Paris. yes. <laughs> and so that's kind of, that's kind of what I imagine the vibe was during yeah. this time. Um, lots of art, lots of um, creativity going on. Um, just a really cool time. I mean, it's still technically the Roaring Twenties. Like that's yeah. the era that we think of when we think of the Twenties. But um, just you know that post-war era. I think it was pro- probably a pretty dang romantic city. But anyway, that being said, I think yeah. Paris is great. I don't blame our buddy Pierre for wanting to mm-hmm. show off that Paris can be a great host city and wanting right. it to redeem itself. I mean, there's history, there's beautiful architecture that we know was around back then. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the buildings that I've seen are so stinking old. So I, I don't know why anyone could go and not at least enjoy it to some degree. So that's my long way of saying that Paris as a city is a wonderful place. Obviously, I didn't live it in the 20s, but... We can imagine. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, obviously, this felt very personal to him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact that this was going to be his last time to have any kind of real say as president of the IOC, which during the 1900 games, he had had really no say in the organization of those games. I can see why he was very adamant about we're going to make sure this is done right and this is going to go well or heads will roll, basically. Yes. So, um, and and then to take us on a short rabbit trail, because you brought up Midnight in Paris. I know we're not a movie (laughs) podcast, but we're going to, we're going to talk about movies for a second. So, so my wife and I have a Valentine's Day tradition that we've had for years which is to literally not go anywhere because Mm -hmm. getting, Mm -hmm. you know, a reservation Mm -hmm. for a restaurant. Plus my wife's an introvert. Like she'd rather stay at home anyway. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We always do fun takeout on Valentine's day. Like exactly. So, (laughs) so we've had this tradition pretty much our entire marriage where we just stay home um, and either, you know, cook a nice meal or yeah, order some takeout, something like that. And then we watch a movie and we have a rotation of three movies that we that we go through for Valentine's. Uh, one of them is Chocolat, uh, mm. Crazy Stupid Love, and then Midnight in Paris. Those are the oh. those are the three in the rotation. So <laughs> I love it. See, that's where Midnight in Paris went wrong. They didn't put Pierre <laughs> into. I the know. Movie. Yeah, missed an opportunity to have him as a as a character, but. Because he was a character, that that's for sure. Uh-huh. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to the Olympics now. And yeah. let's talk about the venues, the opening ceremony, all those fun things. Yeah, we know I am a big fan of the opening ceremony. And the 1924 opening ceremony was held on July 5th at Cologne Olympic Stadium, which could see 45,000 spectators. The games were officially opened by French President Gaston Dumerig. I heard he uses antlers in all of his decorating. Oh, sorry, wrong Gaston. Now we're gonna get <laughs> now we're gonna get the song stuck in our head about. Yep. No one does the about, Olympics like Gaston. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about Beauty and the Beast. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Gosh, we just turned this into a movie episode. I know, pretty right. much. <laughs> <laughs> there were a whopping 3,088 athletes from 44 nations competing across 126 medal events. So that's the most athletes and nations yet. As a reminder, there were 29 nations in Antwerp. So that's quite a jump to say the least. Also significant is the fact there were over 1,000 journalists who attended the Games, signaling the popular appeal of the Olympics across the world. And it's reported there were 625,000 spectators throughout the Games, which is huge. There were 15 total venues used around Paris, including Versailles, being used for the moving deer shooting events. 
And one of the venues was only used for a Pelote Basque tournament, which was a demonstration sport. And speaking of demonstration sports, volleyball was also featured at these games, <laughs> which makes me so excited. That's my sport. Yeah. Yeah, because that means it's, you know, even though it was demonstration here, it is coming as a metal event very soon. So that is exciting to hear. Now, already this sounds like a better organized and better marketed event than 1900. So let me ask you this. Do you think the organizers of the 1900 World's Fair realized the lost opportunity that they had, assuming they were still alive? Because I don't know if they were or not. You know, that's a really good question. I wonder... I wonder if at this stage, as they were watching athletes show up and they were seeing Mm -hmm. that it was becoming a big deal, I wonder if they were kind of waiting for it to fail. You know what I mean? I wonder if they were thinking, Mm -hmm. oh, they got all these people here, but there's no way that they pull this off and it's great. You know, I don't know. I wonder if they were being very pessimistic about it if they were alive. Like you said, we don't know. But yeah, right. um, But I I bet there was some regret there about things that could have gone better. What do you think? Yeah, if any of them were still alive, I have to wonder if they were like, oh, man, we really did kind of mess this up last time around. (laughs) This actually became something and we could have been part of that process instead of literally making it the most difficult thing in the world and trying to kill it. (laughs) So... Mm -hmm. But I don't know. We'll never know. It's just, again, fun to speculate about. Yeah. So, so yeah, let's take a quick little break on that note before we start talking about some of the athletes and some of the sports and all of that good, fun stuff. Well, we know that I always love talking about the women who participated in the games. And mm-hmm. at these Olympics, we had 135 women competing in Paris. So not too shabby. Like it, which on a side note, I bet Pierre loved that. Um, I mean, he didn't stop it. You know, know. let's, uh, let's give him a little bit of credit for at least letting it continue on. (laughs) It's like, we could say maybe he had some growth, but also I don't know if I'm ready to make that assumption. So anyway, (laughs) um, back to Paris. Like in 1920, there were women's events for swimming and diving, and for the first time, a women's foil event was added to the fencing program where Ellen Osir of Denmark won gold, Gladys Davis of Great Britain won silver, and another lady from Denmark, Gret Heckscher, won bronze. In women's diving, the U.S. won every single medal with the exception of bronze in the 10-meter platform event. Elizabeth Becker Pinkston of Philadelphia won gold in the three meter springboard and silver in the 10 meter platform. And Eileen Riggin, who we mentioned in Antwerp 1920, also won a silver here in the three meter springboard on top of winning a bronze in the 100 meter backstroke. Speaking of swimming, U.S. women dominated yet again, winning gold in every event except for the 200 meter brushstroke event, which was won by British swimmer Lucy Morton who became the first British woman to win an individual medal for swimming. So uh, let's talk about tennis for a second, because Paris 1924 would actually be the last appearance of tennis until it would be brought back for the 1988 Seoul Summer Games. This was something I did not know. I did not realize that it disappeared from the Olympic program, considering it had been there since the beginning. So yeah. It's kind of sad, but um, au revoir, tennis. Sorry to see you go, but at least uh, we have the advantage of knowing that you will be back eventually in the Olympics. So Hazel Virginia Whiteman of the U.S. won two golds in tennis. And you'd think that she would have gone for the singles event because she had won 50 national titles in her career. But for the Olympics, she decided to only enter the women's pairs event and the mixed doubles, winning gold in both. This would be her only Olympic appearance, but after the Games, she continued to compete and then became a successful coach. 
So, Sarah, I just had a thought, and I don't have this in the notes because I it literally just hit me right now. Do you think that tennis disappeared from the Olympic program because it was one of the few sports where you could actually have a professional career? And so that would have kept the best athletes from hmm. eligibility for the Olympic Games? You know, that's a really good question. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like we need to research this. Well, I mean, that that just hit me because, of course, this week that we're recording this episode, Serena, you know, (laughs) Williams has been Mm -hmm. all over the news because of her Mm -hmm. retirement and, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, her story and, you know, if anyone's this really is turning into a movie episode. But if anyone's seen the movie King Richard about the Williams family and how, yeah, their dad really kind of set out for them to be professionals from the beginning because there was great earning potential in tennis. It just struck me that maybe this is why it was cut from the program because maybe there just weren't enough really talented tennis players who wanted to keep amateur status. They probably wanted to go pro because they actually could make money off of it. But yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Um, I do wonder if that had something to do with it. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I feel like I feel like we should research this and we'll report back on what we find. Pro- probably so, but it just hit me, and I felt like if I don't say it right now, then I'm going to forget and. And then a, a, we won't ever get back to it. So, well, so here you when go. We, when we get to <laughs> accountability, when we get to 1988, <laughs> we will have an answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I know 1988. Those would have been one of the earliest games after the IOC finally said, "Yeah, okay, it's fine to have professionals in the games." Yeah. So it would make sense for tennis to finally come back at that point, but. Uh, but anyway, so we'll move on from from tennis and talk a little bit more about swimming, except this time on the men's side. So, Sarah, tell us what was going on over there. Yeah, these were the first games to use the standard 50 meter lane distance in the pool and to use lane markers. Hallelujah. And- I know, I know. <laughs> no more muddy pools like in 1908 London. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so yeah, this and it's something that we're so used to that it's hard to yeah. imagine before this, but right. here we are. <laughs> in Paris, we have the emergence of another American swimming star, Johnny Weissmuller, who would win three golds. After his Olympic career, he became famous thanks to Hollywood, where he starred as Tarzan in 12 movies, which, of course, this became a movie episode. We're just, we can't get away from (laughs) it. Right, we can't. (laughs) In addition to his three golds, Weissmuller also was part of the water polo team for the U.S., which meant he also got to take home a bronze medal. So, not too bad of a haul there. (laughs) That's pretty cool that he was also part Mm -hmm. of the water polo team, because I don't feel like we would... Again, we know things were different back then, Mm -hmm. but you wouldn't see that today with someone jumping over from swimming events to, yeah, I'm going to go play water polo now. So cool for him that he he didn't mind being a little bit busier at the games, I guess. Yeah. Well, back to the pool, I guess. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Which I mean, which pool? Because we're talking about water polo and swimming. But anyway, (laughs) um, (laughs) but back to the swimming event, I should say. In fact... (laughs) Team USA got a podium sweep in the 100-meter freestyle that Weissmuller won, where silver went to our buddy that we talked about in our last episode. um, Mm -hmm. Well, not our last episode. From our um, 1920 Antwerp episode, uh, silver went to Duke Kahanamoku and bronze to Samuel Kahanamoku, uh, which is Duke's younger brother. So Duke is really famous of the two, but he also had a little brother that made it to the podium. And I had no idea about this before doing the research that they were Olympic siblings. So there was even one thing that I read while doing the research that said some people suspected that Samuel had actually slowed down a little bit in the final so that Duke could win silver. 
but that's highly unlikely because they were three lanes apart. So there's, I mean, there's yeah. no way he could have been able to tell. And their times were way too close for that to be the case. So yeah, it's, uh, maybe it's a good story. Like if um, he slowed yeah. down because he was getting tired. I mean, it's a really sweet way to <laughs> mask it a little bit. But no shame. He got a bronze. Right. I mean, honestly, for me, as someone who is a younger brother to two older brothers, it's like, no, I'm going to do everything I can to try to beat my older brothers. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No kidding. But yeah. Anyway, (laughs) moving along. (laughs) So uh, we're going to row along to rowing. (laughs) Uh, I know I can't help myself. In the eight (laughs) or event, the Yale crew won gold. Sitting in the second seat was Benjamin McLean Spock, who would go on to be known as Dr. Spock, a famous pediatrician and author of the best-selling parenting book, Baby and Child Care, which I did not realize Dr. Spock was yeah. an Olympic champion. Um, and was, yep. I just feel like we're <laughs> going on this trend, but I feel like if you watch movies or TV shows that either were based in like the 50s or um that were filmed in the 50s i, I don't know one that's coming coming blah, coming to mind is marvelous mrs mazel they talk about dr spock on here mm. and so um he was a, he may not be super famous now um in the internet age because there's so many different parenting resources out there but right. i feel like yeah he was a big deal like if you never heard of dr spock it was significant the stuff that he was putting out so Yeah, I mean, his book was still pretty much required parenting reading through the 80s, even into the early 90s. I mean, Mm -hmm. I recognized his name. Um, And like you, until doing the research here, I was unaware that he was an Olympic gold medalist because he was on the the Yale crew. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. But uh, but yeah, time for us to kind of jump out of the water events that we've been in. And we're going to go over to fencing where, yeah, uh, this is going to get interesting real, real quick. But uh, fencing was dominated by French fencer Roger Ducre, who won five medals total, three of them gold. In fact, he won medals in all three fencing disciplines. Epe, foil, and saber, which, holy cow, that's amazing. <laughs> like, all three just knocked it out of the park. Um, but yeah, so Ducre won a total of eight medals in his Olympic career across 1920, 1924, and 1928 Summer Games. But all of his golds were won here in 1924 in his home country. So there's something to say about having that hometown crowd cheering for you i guess but uh the only olympic fencer to outfence his accomplishment is italy's nato Nadi, who we have talked about in both our 1912 and 1920 episodes but sarah there was also some real fencing drama happening that led to some dueling So, Uh, yeah, we have to have drama. It's no Olympics without some major drama. (laughs) Right. And we haven't really had it in fencing quite yet, uh, to this degree anyway. So there was a scoring controversy in the Team Sabre event where Italy had been facing off against Hungary. Well, after the games were over, how did they decide to settle this? with a real life sword duel. <laughs> so we just got real medieval real quick here. <laughs> um, now let's talk about who was involved in this because it, it's a little convoluted. So I, I'm going to try to break this down and uh, hopefully everyone will be able to follow along. Okay. First off, I'm going to introduce you to this Italian guy named Adolfo Contrane. So he was not on Italy's team, okay? Though some sources claim he was the foil team's coach. What we do know for sure is he was an editor for an Italian fencing publication. And he was known in his writing for making some, 
rather overzealous statements. And, and I'm borrowing that phrase from sportsillustrated.com, who had an amazing story about this. I'm going to post it, uh, the link in the show notes. Everyone should go read it. So Contrané, this wasn't even the first time he had challenged someone to a duel. Uh, he had also once challenged Aldo Nadi. Remember, that's Nato Nadi's younger brother. And they actually wounded each other in the duel before Contrané bowed out and offered the hand of peace to Nadi. I'm not sure what exactly that one was about, but again, he was kind of known for making inflammatory statements, so I'm sure he said something disparaging about Aldo at some point. But concerning the 1924 events, Contrané decided to take it upon himself to challenge the coach of Hungary's saber team, a guy named Italo Centelli, who was himself Italian, even though he was coaching the Hungarian fencing team. So again, I know this is a little convoluted. Uh, we got Contrané, the Italian fencing magazine editor, and then we've got Italo Santelli, the Italian who now coaches the Hungarian team. Well, here's the thing. Since Santelli was 60 years old, his son Giorgio Santelli invoked something called the Code Duelo, where he could substitute for his father in the duel. So he was going to tag in. Giorgio was also himself an Olympic champ, because he had won gold in the Sabre team event during the Antwerp Games. Now, at the time, there was actually a ban for dueling in Italy, but Italy's leader at the time, a guy by the name of Benito Mussolini, you might have heard that name before, and it's probably going to come up again at some point, (laughs) but Mussolini decided, this is important enough, we should definitely waive this ban. (laughs) So, my gosh, (laughs) yeah, so they take fencing really seriously in Italy. (laughs) So, so they scheduled the duel to take place on a barge, which I don't know why they chose a boat for a sword duel, but whatever. Uh, They scheduled it to be on this barge in the Adriatic Sea on August 20th, 1924. Well, Giorgio Santelli was apparently pretty annoyed that he had to travel so far for the duel. And later on in an interview, he stated that he considered cutting off Controne's head. So there's no love lost here between <laughs> these two guys. But, you know, he he didn't do that. Uh, he didn't outright murder uh, Controne. He did stick with the duel. And the duel lasted only two minutes when Santelli struck Contrane in the forehead with his saber. And then at that point, Santelli just walked away, like mic drop, basically, or sword drop. I don't know which one he did. Uh, So he just walked away, which was not customary. Usually at the end of the duel, uh, they would end by drinking a glass of champagne. And he was like, nope, I'm done here. Made my point. I'm out. Um, which, oh yeah, by by the way, get this. <laughs> I have to throw this in. So apparently duels would start with the duelers greeting each other with a kiss on the cheek. <laughs> and then they would end by sharing this glass of champagne, which I don't know, this sounds more like a wedding to me, but <laughs> but whatever. What yeah, do it's I like know? They're, they're fighting for love. I, I guess. I don't know. It, it's very... Very odd, but but yeah, so that was that was the duel that happened. But wait, Sarah, there's more. We have that's another duel to talk about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the Hungarian officials during the Olympic tournament, this guy named Georgi Kovacs, he then challenged Italian team member Oreste Puliti. And why did he do this? Well. In the individual saber competition, the rule at the time was that the competitors from the same country had to face off against each other first. So essentially, it was one of those things where I guess they wanted to avoid a situation where a country could sweep the podium for fencing. So everyone from the same country competed against each other, and then 
you know, the best person from France would go to the quarterfinals, right? The best person from Italy, the best person from Hungary, so on and so forth. Okay. So Italy had sent four competitors and it appeared to Kovacs, who was the official that Puliti had won the bouts against his countrymen far too easily. And based on this, Kovacs decided that the other three Italians had let Puliti win to increase his chance of getting a medal. So Kovacs decided to disqualify Puliti from the tournament. And obviously Puliti was not exactly happy about that situation (laughs) so um so yeah so a few days later we're still at the olympics at this point but puliti sees kovacs and he starts berating him in italian just cursing at him yelling at him well kovacs doesn't understand what he's saying because he's hungarian he doesn't speak italian and kovacs says hey I, i don't know what you're saying and then puliti slaps him across the face and follows it up saying, do you understand that? <laughs> Bam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is good drama that we're getting here. <laughs> now due to the slap that Politi gave to Kovacs, the IOC banned Politi from being able to compete in future Olympic games. Now Politi immediately petitions to overturn this. And, of course, he blames Kovacs for the slap, even though he's the one who slapped Kovacs. But his argument is, well, if Kovacs hadn't disqualified me, then I wouldn't have slapped him. You know, it's that whole thing. So now it's time for dueling, (laughs) apparently. The two decided to settle things by dueling in Paris, but then Kovacs didn't show up. Um... I I guess his Uber was late or whatever. He didn't have a ride to get there in time. We don't really know the story there, but apparently he wasn't running away from it because they decided to move the duel to Hungary uh, in November of that same year. So the two show up for the duel this time, and then they go 20 rounds for over 90 minutes, which... For anyone out there who's not familiar with fencing, that's a long time to be (laughs) in a sword competition with someone else. That's a long time. This went on for so long, it actually started to cause concern for the spectators. And it was actually the people watching who finally stepped in and were like, "Uh, okay, guys, isn't this enough now? Like, shouldn't you both be satisfied and they were. At that point, they were both like, eh, yeah, I think I'm good now. So Politi apologized to Kovacs for slapping him. And then Kovacs promised to support Politi's appeal to the IOC. And, hey, I'll, I'll help you get reinstated for competition. Uh, then they kissed each other on the cheek. Maybe they had some champagne, you know. Maybe they went on vacation together to Fiji. I don't know what else happened, but, you know, everything worked out in the end. But uh, that was a lot. So, Sarah, your thoughts? (laughs) You know, I I knew that you were going to ask me my thoughts on this whole thing. And all I can say is what in the dang heck. (laughs) Like, it is such a mess of a story. Yeah. I like, I don't even know what to say. Oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Th- I don't think that anything like this ever happened again. Right. Right. I, I, I mean, if it did, <laughs> I just haven't discovered it yet. So I, I had never I mean, heard this story before researching for the episode. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you think about it? I mean, in some ways, it kind of makes sense that guys who are already obsessed with fighting with swords Uh would want to keep fighting with swords even when the competition is over. Sure, yeah. So so the overlap between dueling culture and fencing is actually pretty logical when you think about it, but... I don't know. All of this just seems really convoluted and confusing and chaotic. And is it really worth it in the end? That's my question. (laughs) 
I, I know it's supposed to all be about honor, but uh-huh. I don't know. At, at the end of the day, I'm the type of person who just is like, you know what? I'm just going to turn the other cheek and and keep living my life. Who who cares what someone else thinks about me? But that's just me. So, yeah. Anyway, um, after all that, I think we need a little break. <laughs> so, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so let's do that. And then we're going to come back and jump into gymnastics or, or vault into gymnastics, I suppose I should say. But uh, but yeah, we'll come back in a second. Well, after that very exciting <laughs> fencing <laughs> drama, let's uh, let's tumble into something else. Let's do it. So <laughs> in gymnastics. <laughs> Yes, of course, we're talking about gymnastics. 24 men earned a perfect score of 10 from the judges, but 23 of those happened in the rope climbing event. Since so many (laughs) of them had 10s, it was speed that determined the winner. And even so, there still ended up being two bronze medalists in the event. So that's... Maybe there's a reason that we don't have rope climbing anymore. Isn't there's it? <laughs> definitely a reason we don't have rope climbing. But also, I want to point out for a second that, so this is 1924. We have 24 people get a 10 from the judges. And one of those was not in rope climbing. So someone else did get a 10 in a different uh-huh. event. And then it took all the way for not, until Nadia Komenichi for a woman to get a perfect 10, like, I don't know, doesn't, doesn't seem fair. But anyway, it, that's, it's almost like there's a discrepancy between men <laughs> and women in sports and how they're judged. <laughs> Wild. Who saw that coming? Yeah. Anyway, um, sorry. We'll get off the soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we could go on and on, but uh, <laughs> moving on, Slovene Leon Stukeli of Yugoslavia won the gold for the all around and also won gold in horizontal bar and Italy won gold in the team event. So Good job to them. Yeah. And then moving forward into athletics, um, we kind of mentioned this earlier, but a lot of people know the story of Harold Abrahams and Eric Little from the movie Chariots of Fire. We're a movie episode again. I like, here we, here we are. <laughs> I know. I just, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's wild. This It just was meant to be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, Terry's of Fire, <laughs> which is overall pretty faithful to the real life story. One thing it leaves out, though, is that Abrahams actually competed in Antwerp 1920, but had been very disappointed by his performance. The closest he came to meddling there was as a part of G- Team GB's 4x100 relay team, which came in fourth. Like in the movie, he enlisted the help of renowned athletics coach Sam Musabini, who was ahead of his time in terms of training practices, even filming the athletes he trained to have them review their form and was an advocate for women to receive better coaching. We love him. We love him. Yes. Um, (laughs) Yeah, we like this guy. (laughs) So, and, and like, we've already talked a little bit about like filming it being rare. Mm hmm. I mean, not everyone had cameras laying yeah. around, yeah. right? So right. It's it was a pretty like, big deal that he was using this technology to train his athletes. With. Yeah, it was very <laughs> innovative. And yeah. it's like everyone, if you ever watch athletes train, and Jonathan, I'm sure with your son, like being in gymnastics, I'm sure you see mm-hmm. gymnasts always are being, like at least in my experience when I used to work in a gym, um, gymnasts are constantly having their routines filmed and then they go back and watch it with their Mm -hmm. coach and improve. So anyway, it's just, yeah, yeah, this is so common for any sport at this time. Yeah. Um, Well, and now in 2022, but not at the time that we're talking about. Anyway, (laughs) (laughs) how many rabbit trails can we go down on this episode? (laughs) Um, Abraham's credited Musabini for helping him quote, Improve that decisive 1%, which made all the difference between supreme success and obscurity. And talk about supreme success. In Paris, Abrahams won the 100 meter, beating out defending champion Charlie Paddock and Jackson Schultz, bringing the title of fastest man in the world to Great Britain. Abrahams also won silver as part of the 4x100 relay team. 
Paris 1924 would be his last games, but he enjoyed a long career in sports journalism afterwards. Yes, he was a, a huge figure in Great Britain for his journalism, which is something that they hint at in the movie as well, for those who've seen it. And I've actually had the privilege to read some of the articles he wrote uh, for the 1948 London Games when I was doing some research at the Olympic Archive in the LA 84 Foundation a few years ago. Uh, It was a fun, unexpected surprise as I was going through a bunch of old newspaper articles and saw his name (laughs) as the writer. that's pretty cool. Yeah, I had to stop and read them, even though I was supposed to be researching things specifically about diving events, (laughs) which he didn't really cover. (laughs) When I saw his name pop up, I had to give it at least a a couple minutes of my time (laughs) to read. Of course, of course he did. That's pretty cool. Yeah, but moving over to the other half of the Chariots of Fire story, we've got Eric Little, uh, meanwhile, who was known as the Flying Scotsman for his speed. Uh, Now, Little had been born in China to Christian missionaries, and while he was attending Edinburgh University, he enjoyed a very successful rugby career. But then he gave up rugby for the 1923-24 season so that he could focus on training for the Olympics. Now, unlike in the movie Chariots of Fire, he actually knew as soon as the Olympic program was published that the 100-meter final would be held on a Sunday. So in the movie, they have him finding that out on the way to the games because it's more dramatic for it to be this big last minute decision but uh he knew it well in advance but due to his religious beliefs he would not compete on a sunday so he decided to enter some other events even though really the 100 meter was considered his best event so based on the schedule and what wouldn't conflict with his religious beliefs he decided to focus on the 200 meter and the 400 meter And then in Paris, uh, he first won a bronze medal in the 200 meter. Incidentally, that race is the only time we know for sure that Little and Abrahams actually raced against each other. Uh, In that race, Abrahams came in sixth. And then Little went on to win gold in the 400 meter final, where he not only set a personal record, but he also set the Olympic record at that time. Now, in the late 20s, he moved back to China to become a missionary himself there. And during the Japanese occupation of the country during World War II, he was put in an internment camp where he would organize games and activities to keep up the morale of the other prisoners. While he was in the camp, he was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor, which probably wasn't helped by the fact that he was in an an internment camp, right? So, uh, you know, terrible workload in the camp, plus malnourishment, things like that. And then on February 21st, 1945, he died at the age of 43, uh, five months before the camp would then be liberated by Allied forces. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, sad end to his life. But, you know, at the same time, he he did die doing what he loved to do, which was Mm -hmm. serving other people. So, you know, uh, not to speak for him, but, you know, I don't know that he would have changed his story. (laughs) Yeah. He's one of those athletes that um, even if you may not be aligned with his faith, you can respect the legacy that he left. Um, Mm -hmm. and, And just, yeah, he had an incredible life story from beginning to end, I think, but yeah, just he had such a such a legacy. And I feel like there's many people I know who see him as a role model who um, may not even be a Christian like he was. And I think that's right. I think that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Well, he he exemplified his principles and his he convictions did. He in did. a way that most people wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. So. And, it, and it wasn't it wasn't about him and just trying to, like, get notoriety for it or anything like that. He was just being who he was right right absolutely 
but uh but anyway so that's our little kind of uh chariots of fire bit for this uh for this episode but uh but sarah let's uh let's move on to some of the other athletic events that haven't been turned into movies uh what else was going on <laughs> yeah but are we gonna incorporate any other movies into this episode Time will tell. <laughs> i don't know we'll see <laughs> Uh, U.S. athlete Harold Osborne also made a name for himself by setting records in both the high jump and in the decathlon, earning his place as the world's greatest athlete. We mentioned Pavo Nermi, the Finnish runner, back in the 1920 episode, and here he added five gold medals to the three he won in Antwerp. On July 10th, he won gold in the 1500 meters, and then just under an hour later, he was in the 5000 meter, where he also won gold. So that's wild. mm -hmm. That's Uh unbelievable. (laughs) Uh huh. Yes. Less than an hour later. That's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's um, not much recovery time at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now let's see if I get this name right. Uh, fellow Finn, <laughs> B.A. Ritola, also had a strong showing, winning four golds and two silvers. In the 10,000 meters, he won by half a lap and beat his own <laughs> world record by 12 seconds. That's a long time. I forgot about writing this in the episode. Half a lap. Yeah, that's a that's a lot. That's a lot. (laughs) Then three days later, he won steeplechase by seventy five (laughs) meters. He and Pavo were part of the three thousand meter team race, and the Finnish team won by twelve meters. His two silvers at these games were in events won by Pavo. No surprise. So. I just these guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What can like, what can you say? <laughs> they're they're completely out of control. And so yeah, I mean I really don't have words other than just it is remarkable and incredible and rare. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well and that's a that's a reason so many people consider Pavo Normi to be the greatest long distance runner of all times Mm because you got guys like him doing what he's doing and then all these other Finnish runners just doing amazing things that human bodies shouldn't be able to do uh like Mm -hmm. winning gold in two long distance races in an hour (laughs) yeah so uh, which, Definitely. speaking of long distance, let's go to uh, our favorite long distance race of the Woo-hoo. marathon. Yeah, because in the marathon, this is actually here in 1924. This is where we see the standard distance of 26.2 miles actually get set. Now, yes, that distance had first been originally created for London 1908, but in the Olympics in between, we had had other distances. In our 1920 episode, we had talked about how that was the longest Olympic marathon. So uh, at 1924 to modern day, it's always 26.2 miles or 42.195 kilometers for all of our metric friends out there. So anyway, if you want to hear again how that weird amount of distance was set, you can go back to the 1908 episode and and hear how that happened but back to 1924 the start of the race was actually delayed due to concerns about the heat that day so the race didn't even start until five o'clock p.m which that's pretty late in the day to be starting a race that's going to be going on for two and a half three hours long but but whatever safety first not gonna knock it um And then, Sarah, I will give you one guess what country provided the marathon with its winner. Oh, gosh. Um, Putting me on the spot here, but uh, Finland. Yes, (laughs) Finland. (laughs) How would I ever guess that after what we just talked about? (laughs) Yeah. So, Finnish runner Alvin Stenrus won the 1924 Paris Marathon. Uh, 12 years after he had won bronze in the marathon back in Stockholm, 1912. So uh, this is not his first marathon medal. Pretty impressive. Uh, He was also part of the silver medal cross-country team also back in 1912, 
but he had decided to skip the 1920 games. Not sure why. Maybe there was something good on TV that night he didn't want to miss. Whatever. Uh, Despite the hot conditions on race day, he won by six minutes, while his fellow countryman, Hannes Kolleminen, who we've talked about before, uh, he had won the marathon back in 1920, but he ended up being a DNF for this race. So uh, we also had several new countries show up for the marathon this time around. We had Czechoslovakia, Ecuador, and Spain sending competitors for the first time for the marathon. So that's always exciting. And then once again, we have to mention this guy. <laughs> Our good friend Shizo Kanakuri of Japan came back to compete here as well. And yes, he was still listed as a missing person in Sweden at the time. But if you know, him. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but other than that, pretty low drama for the marathon here in 1924. But yeah, let's go ahead and kind of wrap things up and talk about the legacy of these games and as always, we kicked that off with the metal table. So, Sarah, what did that look like for 1924 Paris? The games closed on July 27th with the final medal table tally looking like this. U.S. won 99 total medals, 45 of which were gold. France won 41 total with 14 gold. Finland won 37 total with 14 gold. Great Britain won 35 total, nine were gold. Sweden with 29 total medals, four of which were gold. In the end, the legacy of the Paris Games in 1924 was that they did exactly what Coubertin set out to do. They redeemed Paris from 1900 and firmly established the Olympic Games as an international symbol of peace and unity through sports. It also marked the first time a city hosted the Games twice, though it would take another 100 years for Paris to host again in 19 or I'm sorry, in 2024, <laughs> which I think we're all looking forward to. I mean, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm stoked. I'm hoping that we are yeah. there. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. That would be fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't want to count my chickens before they hatch, but um, hopefully we'll be there cheering along but it's pretty exciting yeah but overall exactly what you said 1924 paris games were really well run i they really kind of checked all the boxes that coubertin wanted them to check and he ended his um uh, his what do you call it tenure as president mm-hmm. of the ioc on a high note so i think he could be happy about that as he started his retirement so to speak so (laughs) so yeah so they're still remembered as very well run games very successful olympic games in the history of the olympics good job to paris so yeah i'm glad we got to cover it in a little bit more detail yeah definitely um and not that we're gonna mention another movie but maybe uh, there's another there's another something coming up. So <laughs> if you want to learn more about the 1924 Olympic Games, you can check out the documentary. So see, not a movie, a documentary on HBO Max that has footage <laughs> of the events. There's a link to it in the show notes. But if you enjoyed this episode and we really hope you did, then make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our next episode where we'll be headed to Switzerland for the second Winter Olympiad in St. Moritz, 1928. But until then, ought to see you later. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content features 
featured in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.